talk to you about what it is to create change in a culture, how to inspire people to become defined by a vision of the future instead of the memories of the past, and what does it take to truly change, and what is change, and why is change so hard. And over the last uh, 10 years or so, my company uh, has a research team, and we have done scientific studies on what it takes to truly change. Is there a formula that you can demystify the process? And that most people, they wait for crisis or trauma or disease or diagnosis or loss. When they reach their lowest denominator, they finally make up their mind to change. And my message is, why wait? That we can learn and change in a state of pain and suffering, or we can learn and change in a state of joy and inspiration. And we are literally in a new, uh, a new era right now. And this era is about information. And in an age of information, ignorance is a choice. We don't need a doctor, a teacher, a governor, a priest, a rabbi, a minister to gain information any longer. Because we have access to information, people are taking their power back. Technology affords us the ability to research anything we want to research. And every time you learn something new, you make new synaptic connections in your brain. In fact, learning is making new connections. And the Nobel Prize laureate Candell in the year 2000 found that when people learn just one bit of information and they concentrated on it for an hour, they doubled the number of connections in their brain from 1,300 connections to 2,600 connections. But if they didn't review that information, if they didn't think about it, if they didn't repeat it over and over in their mind, those connections pruned apart within hours or days. So if learning is making new synaptic connections, then remembering is maintaining and sustaining those connections, keeping those connections in a long-term relationship. And this four-day retreat is an opportunity for you to gain information, to retreat from your lives, and to break from the routine, mundane way that you do things long enough for you to begin to learn new information. And that information then begins to become installed in the circuitry in your brain. The question is though, what do you do with that information? That if you can then take that information and apply it, personalize it, demonstrate it, initiate it in some way, if you can get your behaviors to match your intentions, if you can get your actions equal to your thoughts, if you can get your mind and body working together, you're going to have a new experience. An experience then enriches the philosophical circuits in the brain, laying down networks of neurons. And the moment those neurons string into place, the brain makes a chemical. And that chemical is called a feeling or an emotion. And the moment you feel like a leader, the moment you feel more unlimited, the more you feel gratitude, from some experience, now you're teaching your body chemically to understand what your mind is intellectually understood. And we can say that knowledge is for the mind and experience is for the body. And in that moment, you are embodying the truth of that philosophy. And for one moment, your mind and body are aligned to a new destiny. And it is the environment and the interaction in the environment that actually changes genes. And we've measured this that in four days, people can change their genetic expression if they begin to think differently, make new choices, do different things, create new experiences, create new feelings, they will change their genetic destiny. So then, in that moment then, if you've done it once, or if you're training somebody to modify their behaviors, and they're able to do it once, then they should be able to do it again, yes or no? And if you can repeat an experience over and over again, over and over again, you will begin to neurochemically condition the mind and body to begin to work as one. And when you've done something so many times that your body now knows how to do it as well as your mind, now it's innate in you. It's second nature. It's easy, it's familiar, it's automatic. You're beginning to master that philosophy. And so we have studied brains in change. We've done over 8,500 brain scans, and we now know there's a formula that you can teach people to change. We work with CEOs and uh, companies all over the world, from Coca-Cola to Google to uh, Sony to Cisco to Pfizer, in an interest to work with upper management to teach them a model of change. And, and when you change individuals, you can change a culture. So then, my interest then is to not only measure just the brain, but we also know that it, it requires two ingredients 
for a person to begin to make a significant change. Number one is a clear intention, a vision, an idea of the future. And when a person begins to select a new idea in the future, if they can begin to emotionally embrace what that future is going to feel like, because they're so caught up in their inner vision, they begin to feel an elevated emotion. An emotion like gratitude, an emotion like inspiration, an emotion like motivation. And you can actually measure what happens to the heart when this occurs. So then when a person starts feeling the emotions of their future in that instant, their heart begins to respond very differently. And we've measured this. The heart begins to become more coherent. It starts to beat in a more rhythmic pattern. And that by living by the emotions of fear and resentment and frustration and impatience actually causes the heart to beat out of rhythm. And people spend 70% of their time of their lives living by those stress hormones. Living in stress is living in survival. So the fundamental question is, can you teach people then how to create a more coherent brain? And can you teach them how to regulate their heart and be able to control how their heart responds? And our research shows that that's absolutely possible. And you don't have to be a Buddhist monk. You don't have to be a nun with 40 years of devotion. You don't have to be a minister, a scholar, an academic, that common people can learn how to do this. The side effect of this is that they begin to produce change in their immune system, changes in their gene expression, diseases go into remission. <clears throat> we start to see people having very transcendental moments that begin to redefine who they are. So then a clear intention and elevated emotion allows the person then to begin to see a new possibility. The question is then, can they sustain that state? Now, your brain is organized to reflect everything you know in your life. Your brain is a record of the past. It's an artifact of everything you've learned and experienced to this moment. So most people wake up in the morning and the first thing they do is they start to think about their problems. And those problems are memories that are etched in their brain. And those memories are connected to certain people at certain places with certain things at certain times. And the moment they begin to think about their problems, we could say that they're thinking in the past. Now, every single one of those problems has an emotion associated with them. So then the moment they think about a problem, the brain turns on circuits that are connected to the past. And then all of a sudden they start feeling unhappy. They start feeling unworthy. They start feeling fear or anxiety. Now thoughts are the language of the brain and feelings are the language of the body. And how you think and how you feel creates your state of being. So most people start their day from a state of being that's completely derived from the familiar past. And when people live in the familiar past, they will create a predictable future. And then they get up and they do a series of routine automatic behaviors. They, they stretch, then they grab their cell phone, they check their WhatsApp, they check their text, they check their email, they check their Facebook, they take a picture of their feet, they post it on Facebook, then they tweet, then they Twitter, then they check the news, and then all of a sudden now they're connected to everything known in their lives. And then all of a sudden they go through that same routine behavior. From waking up, getting a cup of coffee, taking a shower, driving to work, and they're in a program. And then we could say then their body is dragging them into a predictable future based on what they did in the past. And 95% of who we are by the time we're 35 years old is a set of memorized behaviors, emotional reactions, unconscious beliefs and perceptions, hardwired attitudes that function just like a computer program. The person has a thought or a reaction to something in their environment, and then they go unconscious. And so people in the midst of change are trying to use 5% of their conscious mind to work against 95% of what they've memorized subconsciously because they've been doing it for 10 or 20 years and their body is on autopilot. And we can say then that person has lost their free will to a program and they're headed for a genetic destiny. So if we're not defined by a vision of the future, then we could say then, for the most part, we are living by the memories of the past. <laughs> and we could say then, a person who's in the state, 
believes in their past more than they believe in their future. It means they're romancing their past and more in love with their past than they are with the future. That they're telling the same story of their past instead of telling a new story of their future. And the latest research in neuroscience shows that memory is creative, which means then 50% of what you talk about in your past isn't even the truth, that you make stuff up. That means that so many people are reliving a miserable life that they never even had. And they do that because it reaffirms their identity. Now, so a person then, if they wake up and they feel like a failure, the moment they feel like a failure, they're gonna think thoughts equal to how they feel. They are gonna think they're a failure. And when they think thoughts that are related to failure, they create the same chemicals in their body to feel more like a failure. And the brain's checking in with the body and the body says, yeah, you're really a failure. And then you start thinking more thoughts. And this cycle of thinking and feeling and feeling and thinking conditions the body to subconsciously become the mind of that emotion. And the body as the unconscious mind does not know the difference between an actual experience in your life that creates an emotion and an emotion that you're creating by thought alone. The body is believing it's living in the same past experience 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. And the redundancy of that cycle then conditions the body to become the mind of that emotion. Now the body's literally in the past and you can't create a new future holding on to the emotions of the past. So you say to the person, why are you this way? Why are you suffering? Why are you unhappy? Why, are you, why do you feel so much fear? And they'll say, I am this way because of some experience that's happened to me 25 years ago. And the stronger the emotion people feel from some event in their environment, the more altered they are in their inner state, the more they pay attention to the cause. And in that moment, the brain takes a snapshot, and that's called a memory. And people think neurologically within the circuits of those past experiences, and they feel chemically within the boundaries of those emotions, and that becomes their identity. And so they spend their whole entire life waiting for something outside of them to change how they feel inside of them. So then, to change then is to be greater than the body as the mind to be greater than those automatic habituations and unconscious programs. Now, if you're not being defined by the vision of the future, your vision of the future, and you wake up in the morning and you come to your senses, it's your senses that plug you into the reality that you live. And the moment you come back to your senses and you start seeing the same people and you go to the same places and you do the exact same thing at the exact same time, it's your outer environment that's controlling how you think and feel. And we can say then that your outer environment is controlling your thoughts and feelings. So you say to someone, why are you in a bad mood? I'm in a bad mood because of that person or that experience, which means then the person is a victim to their environment because they're allowing their outer environment to control their inner environment. Are you with me still? So then how many people in this room believe that your thoughts have something to do with your destiny? I'm curious. The way you think has something to do with your future. So you think 60 to 70,000 thoughts in one day. Out of those 60 to 70,000 thoughts that you think in one day, 90% of those thoughts are the same thoughts as the day before. So if you believe that your thoughts have something to do with your destiny, and 90% of those thoughts are the same thoughts as yesterday, your life is going to stay the same because the same thoughts always lead to the same choices. The same choices always lead to the same behaviors. The same behaviors create the same experiences, and the same experiences produce the exact same emotions. And those same emotions influence your very same thoughts and your biology, your neurocircuitry, your neurochemistry, your hormones, and even your genetic expression is equal to how you think, how you act, and how you feel. So it makes sense then when you begin to learn new information, if you can take that information and do something with it when you leave this event and make a new choice, a new choice will lead to a new behavior. A new behavior creates a new experience, a new experience produces a new emotion, a new emotion that inspires new thoughts, and we would call that evolution. 
So then your personality creates your personal reality. That's it. That is it. And your personality is made up of how you think, how you act, and how you feel. So the present personality that's sitting here today called you has created the present personal reality that you have, your life. Yes or no? So then, if you think the same way, you act the same way, and you feel the same way, then your life stays the same. But if you can teach people how to change the way they think, change the way they act, and change the way they feel, they will begin to create a new life. How many people understand? So then most people try to create a new personal reality as the same personality, and it doesn't work. That you literally have to become someone else. Now think about this. I said to change is to be greater than your body. The body as the mind that's been conditioned over time emotionally and habitually. To change then is also to be greater than your environment, to be greater than the circumstances in your life. And every great person in history understood this, that they were defined by a vision of the future, so much so that they began to live as if that future reality was already manifesting. They weren't waiting for it to happen, they were creating it. And to change then is to be greater than time, to not be in the program of the familiar future or the, or the predictable future or the familiar past, to learn, teach people how to be present. And so in the hotel industry, when I check into a hotel, I can tell you in two seconds if the staff is trained. I can tell you because I'll know if they're authentically connecting with me, if they're present with me, if they have the ability to, to connect, to, to collaborate, to, to begin to emotionally interact, that they have some quality, some essence that's authentic. And that authenticity, turns out, is just training. It's just teaching people uh, some really simple skills. So then when it becomes time to change, the hardest part about change is not making the same choice as you did the day before. And the moment you decide to make a different choice, get ready. It's going to feel uncomfortable. It's going to feel unfamiliar. There's going to be some uncertainty. You're not going to be able to predict the next moment. Now, most people say, well, look, I've suffered for the last 20 years. Today, I'm not going to complain. I'm not going to blame. I'm not going to make excuses. I'm not going to feel sorry for myself. No more self-pity. I'm just going to stop. Now, they've been thinking and feeling this way for 30 years, and all of a sudden, they're going to stop. First two hours goes really well. Then they break a fingernail, or they run out of toilet paper, and their day is ruined. And all of a sudden, then, the body is saying, hey, you have been feeding the same chemistry to this body by feeling the same emotion, and now there's a disruption. Now, remember, the body's the mind. So the moment the person makes a different choice, the body starts saying, well, let me influence the mind. And all of a sudden, a person starts hearing these voices in their head. You know, start tomorrow. This doesn't feel right. It's your mother's fault. It's your ex's fault. I'll never change. It's too hard. And if people respond to that thought as if it's true, that same thought leads to the same choice. The same choice leads to the same behavior. The same behavior creates the same experience. The same experience produces the same familiar emotion. It reaffirms their identity, and they say, this feels right, feels familiar. But going from the old self to the new self is the neurological, it is the biological, it is the chemical, it is the hormonal genetic death of the old self. And in that void, in that unknown, that is the perfect place to create from. That means then, people say to me, I am in change and I can't predict my future. And I always say the same thing to them, the best way to predict your future is to create it. Not from the known, but from the unknown. What thoughts do you want to fire and wire in your brain? What behaviors do you want to demonstrate in one day? And the act of closing your eyes, this is neuroscience now, you can teach people how to do this and have them mentally rehearse what they're going to do. We do this in corporations. All of a sudden, the person gets so present what they're about to do and they start rehearsing it in their mind that their brain doesn't know the difference between what's going on out there and what's going on in here. And all of a sudden, they start to install the neurological hardware in their brain in preparation for that day. The brain looks like they've already done it. And if you keep doing it over and over again, the hardware becomes a software program. And what do you know? All of a sudden, this person starts 
acting like a happy person. Well, they installed the circuits to do that. They start thinking in new ways. There's no, there's no magic there. And then can you teach a person how to emotionally condition their body into the future? Which means then they're not going to wait for their life to change, to feel gratitude or to feel wholeness or feel love. That is a that is an antiquated model of reality. People spend their whole life waiting for something outside of them to change how they feel inside of them. And they spend their whole life living in lack and separation. But when they begin to emotionally teach their body what that future feels like, their body as their unconscious mind begins to believe that they're living in that future reality in the present moment. And the side effect of that now is they start feeling like it's already happened. And now they're no longer looking for change in their life. They are the change in their life. How many people understand? So then we work with companies and organizations about this concept about creating a culture. How do you change a culture? And what is culture? There's a neuroscience to culture. You have a brain, and you share the same brain as the person next to you in a very, very gross anatomy sense. And because the gross anatomy of the brain is very similar from person to person, we have some very universal traits. We smile when we're happy, we frown when we're sad, we sleep at night, we grab a stick the same way, and structure and function are highly related. But then we have our individual traits, and our individual traits is a reflection of how we're wired in our brain. That is the gross anatomy compared to our minute ana anatomy. And you're wired differently from the person sitting next to you because it's a combination of nature and nurture. And is it nature or nurture? The answer is yes, it's both. So then your experiences, the things you've learned, and your genes wire your brain. So then what is the bridge that connects it? Well, we could say then it's like having a hand. Everybody has a hand. That's the gross anatomy. And then there is your fingerprint, and that's your individual trait. That's the mind anatomy. So then the bridge between our universal trait and our individual trait is called culture. And cultures are created by environment. And what is environment made of? People, objects, spaces, things, places, and time. And creating an environment that is novel or unique creates a change in culture. Now, cultures are usually based on the past. What has sustained a culture is because of the environment. So a culture of northern Mongolia would be very different than a culture in Holland just because of a different environment. Would you agree? And so they develop certain customs, certain traditions, certain language, certain survival skills. They have their particular habits, their nuances, their attitudes, their beliefs, their art, their history, <clears throat> and their social structures. But most cultures are defined by the past. So then <clears throat> we have this idea of changing a culture by a vision of the future that we would call our future present cultural reality or then there is the memory of the past that is our past present cultural reality so then if you combine a clear intention with an elevated emotion and a leader does this very well because when a person comes out of the resting state and they can begin to emotionally connect with the leader's future they will no longer be looking at their future through the lens of the past. They will see a new possibility. And when you combine that clear intention with an elevated emotion, the thought and the feeling creates a new state of being. And a new state of being is a new personality. And teaching people how to sustain that state for an extended period of time, all of a sudden, you start experiencing what we call flow or magic or the universe working with us or opportunities begin to all of a sudden start to appear before us. So you keep people living by the same unconscious intentions and same familiar emotions, they will be predictable and nothing will change. <clears throat> so we could say then, if you combine a clear intention with an elevated emotion, you're beginning to change your state of being without something in your outer environment. This is all happening in your inner environment. If you're living by the past, you're creating memories from your outer environment. So then, 
there are five types of motivation that we've studied. The highest form of motivation is called duty motivation, purpose motivation, or what we call mission motivation. It is a vision that's bigger than you. And the bigger the vision that is more inclusive, the more selfless it is, the more a person will be inspired. That is the highest form of motivation. Transforming individuals in order to transform the world or the culture is my mission. I live by that every day. It gets me up in the morning. I can travel for three weeks at a time. I don't mind doing it. I come home for four or five days and I leave for three weeks again. That's my life because I'm mission motivated. The next form of motivation is called personal conviction motivation, self-starter motivation, or what we call entrepreneurial motivation. Not the highest form of motivation, but still a high form of motivation. And this is when people say, I'm going to do this because I said I'm going to do it. But people who have a mission motivation naturally have personal conviction. It falls right in line. The next form of motivation is called ethics motivation or morality-based motivation. This is good and bad, right and wrong, positive and negative. This is polarized. When the person is bad, they want to be good. When they're good, they want to be bad. And it's not a very high form of motivation, but a person who has mission motivation or purpose motivation, who has personal conviction aligning with it, they have a sense of ethics and morality. It just kind of falls into place. The next form of motivation is called ego-centered motivation or self-aggrandizement motivation. This is where people doing it for attention or fame or recognition. Not a very high form of motivation, but a person who's mission motivated, who has personal conviction, who has a sense of ethics, will naturally get attention or recognition. And the lowest form of motivation, check it out, is called money motivation. And it is the most selfish form of motivation. And we can spot that on a person a mile away. Would you agree? So now, what is mission, what is purpose, what is intent? The cute thing about this is that purpose or mission is ongoing. There's never an end to it. You could have a purpose to go east, and you will never run out of east. You could have a purpose to be healthy, and you will never run out of health. There's always more health to have. You could have a purpose to be wealthy. There's never an end to that, or abundance, whatever you want to call that. You could have a purpose to gain knowledge and information, and that's ongoing. So then, bringing a vision into reality means that we're grabbing from a world of possibilities and we have to bring it into the world of reality. That it starts with a thought and when it ultimately manifests, it manifests as matter. In quantum physics, it's called the wave function. The wave of the, uh, of the atom is really where possibility exists. The particle is the collapsing of that energy into materialism. The immaterial to the material, or we could say from a world beyond the senses to a world of the senses. So then, if you, if you have a vision or a purpose, then the next thing to do is to set up goals in alignment with your purpose or your vision. And goals then help us to stay on purpose. And the more you are on purpose, the easier it is for you to maintain your goals. So then, if you work with a department, you work with sales, you work with management, you work with HR, whatever it is, if you can get a subculture of people aligning to a purpose, and then all of a sudden sharing similar goals, the outcome of that department, you will begin to create quite a bit of motivation and quite a bit of inspiration amongst that community. So here's an example. If you're in the United States, if you had a purpose to start in Los Angeles and go east, if you set up certain cities as goals along the way to get there, as long as you are heading east, those goals help you to stay on purpose. And all along, every goal then is proof that you're headed in the right direction. You could have a purpose to get healthy. And then there are certain behaviors and choices that you have to make in order to get healthy. These are specific goals that you would want to uh, arrive at. It means that you would have to make some changes in the way that you do things. You could have a purpose then to become abundant or become more wealthy. You can start your own business first year. You can hire two staff, <clears throat> buy a new vehicle, buy a new house, and then ultimately you can set a goal for making a certain amount of money. Same thing with knowledge. 
you can start off with getting an associate's degree, getting a bachelor's degree, getting a master's degree, getting a doctorate degree, doing research. Those goals are in alignment with purpose. Is this making sense to everybody? Space is another example. It's a great way to say that the exploring of, of, of adventure, the adventure of exploring distant planets and galaxies, as long as there is goals along the purpose, uh, we reach uh, our end. So then, what is the biggest reason then of why people lose their purpose? Well, there's three things, as far as I'm concerned, that make a person excellent as an individual. Number one is purpose. In my company, everybody that works for my company shares the same purpose as me. Because we work long hours, our events start at six in the morning, we go till six and seven in the evening. We have 1,500 people in Bonn, Germany next week that we're running an event for. We gotta be on task, we gotta have everything in order. We have to be able to schedule, we have to be able to deal with challenges and problems, and everybody's gotta share that purpose. The next thing in my company that is ultimately important is called competence. Competence means you're really good at what you do. You're skilled. If you have competence and you have purpose and you combine it with accountability, accountability is if you're asked to do something or you say you're gonna do something, you actually do it. And if you can combine purpose, competence, and accountability, you will have excellence in an individual. And that excellence then is the person becoming what is called in biology, autopoesis or autopoetic, self-sustaining. The cell can take care of itself. The individual can take care of, it, uh, of his or herself. So then purpose, competence, and accountability diminishes the amount of management you have to do because it creates trust in the culture. In other words, if you're on purpose, you're competent and you're accountable, and I'm on purpose, I'm competent and accountable, I don't have to think about you. Nobody has to think about you, you're doing your job. The moment a person either is less competent, less accountable, or loses their purpose, they will be outstanding. They will stand out in the culture because someone is gonna have to stop doing what they're doing and shift their attention to what the other person is doing. So then, running an Olympic level team, I mean, we just ran an event in Vancouver and for a thousand people last uh, two weeks ago, and the staff in that hotel we're so purpose-driven, so competent, so accountable. We had so much fun. The event was so easy because they connected. They went the extra mile. They, they, they knew how to uh, be authentic. They knew how to serve in a very selfless way. They knew how to come from their hearts. They were trained really well. And so we didn't have to do anything except focus on our community, on the people that were at our event. And it makes it uh, so inviting to return. So biggest reason then, why people lose their focus is because of stress. Living in stress is living in survival. And stress is when your brain and body are knocked out of homeostasis. The stress response is what the body innately does to return itself back to normal. Now, all organisms in nature can tolerate short-term stress. The deer is being chased by a pack of coyotes. The moment the deer sees the threat or the danger in her outer environment, she switches on a, a, a nervous system called the sympathetic nervous system. And the sympathetic nervous system is going to mobilize 100% of the body's resources and vital energy to survive in that environment. It's not going to go 50%. It's not going to go 30%. It's going to go 100%. So then when you begin to turn on that stress reaction, the body and the brain get an arousal of energy, a rush of adrenaline, and the rush of adrenaline wakes the brain and body up. And people become addicted to this rush of adrenaline, and now they need the people and the problems in their lives to reaffirm their addiction to this emo uh, emotion. They need the bad job, they need the bad relationship, they need the difficult situation in their life because it makes them feel something. That means then they become addicted to the life they don't even like. So check it out. The moment you perceive a threat, 
in your outer environment, you turn on that nervous system called the fight or flight nervous system. There's a pattern recognition in your thinking brain, that yellow part of the brain, that signals another part of the brain, that's where the sympathetic nervous system is, to begin to change your internal environment. The signal goes all the way down to the witless adrenal glands, and all of a sudden there's a release of adrenaline. And the release of adrenaline now causes very strong physiological changes in the brain and body. Pupils dilate, you gotta see better. Salivary juice is shut off, not a time to eat lunch. Heart rate increases, respiratory rate increases, and blood is sent to the extremities, and now the body is prepared to do battle, to run, to fight, or to hide. How many people understand? You felt this, yes? And in that state, you're in survival. But what if it isn't a lion? What if it's your mother-in-law? And now you're reacting to the same conditions in your environment because you've had some past experiences with your mother-in-law. What was once highly adaptive becomes very maladaptive because when you turn on the stress response and you can't turn it off, now you're headed for disease because no organism in nature can live in emergency mode for an extended period of time. How many people are with me? Does that make sense? And people spend 70% of their time then reacting to something in their life just to reaffirm those emotions. Well, check it out. Because of the size of the human neocortex, we can think about our problems and we can turn on the stress response just by thought alone. You know what that means? If those hormones of stress are addictive and you can turn on the stress response just by thought alone, people become addicted to their own thoughts. And if it's a scientific fact that the long-term effects of the hormones of stress push the genetic buttons and create disease, and you can turn on that stress response just by thought alone, that means that your thoughts can literally make you sick. Begs the question then, if your thoughts could make you sick, is it possible then that your thoughts could make you well? So we took a group of people, 120 people, just like you, and we had them trade emotions like anger, fear, hostility, aggression, competition, jealousy, envy, all those survival emotions, depression, hopelessness, powerlessness, just for an elevated emotion like gratitude, a heart-centered emotion. And we had heart rate monitors on them to make sure that they were feeling those emotions. We measured their cortisol levels at the beginning of four days. We measured another chemical called IgA, immunoglobulin A, your body's primary defense against bacteria and virus. It's better than any flu shot. It is your body's natural flu shot, and it works better than a flu shot. As stress hormones go up, guess what happens to IgA? It goes down. If you're mobilizing all this energy for some threat in your outer environment, there's no energy in your inner environment for growth and repair for long-term building projects, and the immune system is compromised. So we said, let's trade those emotions for an elevated emotion. We'll, we'll have you do this just 10 minutes a day, three times a day for three days. And then we're going to measure your IgA levels and your cortisol levels. People's cortisol levels went down about 17%. That's pretty good. But their IgA levels went up 50%. Now, if a pharmaceutical company found a drug that was strengthening your immune system by 50%, it would be on every television commercial. And yet, your nervous system is the greatest pharmacist there is. So teaching people how to do that begins to make dramatic changes in their body and in their health. So if your thoughts can make you sick, then it makes sense that your thoughts can make you well. Now, after you have an emotional reaction to someone or something in your life, there's a refractory period of chemical change. You're altered in some way. Now, <clears throat> an experience usually does that, and if you don't know how to control your emotional reaction, and you allow that emotional reaction to run for hours or days, that's called a mood. What's wrong with you? Oh, I'm so glad you asked. I'm in a mood. Why are you in a mood? Well, this thing happened to me five days ago, and I'm having one long emotional reaction. You keep that same refractory period going on for weeks or months, months that's called the temperament. Why is he so angry? I don't know, let's ask him. Why are you so angry? Oh, I had this thing happen to me seven months ago, and I'm memorizing my emotional reaction. 
You keep that same refractory period going for years on end. That's called the personality trait. And most people's personalities are based on the past. Teaching people how to shorten the refractory period of their emotional reactions is one of the greatest things you could ever do, and it's called emotional intelligence. We were working with Gallo Vineyards a couple of years ago, and I was sitting with their upper management. They wanted to be, they want to be a Fortune 100 company. And so I said to these, the team, so what have you guys done to change your culture? They started, oh, we did this, we did that, and we studied emotional intelligence. And I said, well, so what's emotional intelligence to you? I said, they looked at each other and they said, I don't know. I said, you had a three-day seminar, you can't tell me what it is. I took out a napkin, I drew this little thing, and I said, shortening your refractory period to your emotional reactions is emotional intelligence. And they all, oh, all, oh, and that's it. So then, if you can't stop some emotion, then it means then you must be addicted to it because an addiction is something you think you can't stop. So then teaching people how to do that and to regulate their inner world begins to produce a more productive, a more innovative, a more creative, a more sophisticated, a more uh, uh, creative and connecting person. So then you either live in a state of survival and that's living in stress and living in survival is not a time to learn. It's not a time to open your heart. It's not a time to create. It's not a time to have a vision. It's a time to run, fight, or hide. And so most companies, eight hours a day, people are living in emergency mode and they can't connect. They can't trust. They can't give thanks because the primitive system is switched on and you don't trust in the jungle. You don't open your heart, you would be vulnerable. You gotta compete. And so then changing the culture then is redefining it by changing the people. And when you change the people, you change the culture. So then, your thoughts and feelings come from your memories. You take a series of thoughts that are connected to feelings, a thought and a feeling, a thought and a feeling, a thought and a feeling. That's called an attitude. You have a series of good thoughts that are connected to a series of good feelings. You have a good attitude today. You have a series of negative thoughts that are connected to some pretty bad feelings. You have a bad attitude today. So if how you think and how you feel creates a state of being, attitudes are just shortened states of being. You could have a good attitude in the morning and a bad attitude in an afternoon. If you take an attitude, an attitude, an attitude, and you start com combining them together, those attitudes then ultimately form what's called a belief. And a belief is just a thought you keep thinking over and over again until you hardwire it in your brain. And all beliefs are based on past experiences. And those experiences have emotions, and the moment you have an experience and you feel altered about that experience, and you draw a conclusion about that event, you just created a belief. And the boundaries of people's beliefs are how they feel. So if how you think and how you feel creates a state of being, and the repetition of thinking and feeling over and over again conditions the body to subconsciously become the mind, most beliefs are subconscious states of being. People have beliefs about money, about relationships, about love, about God, about food, and it's all based on past experiences. You take a belief, a belief, a belief, and you string them together, you form what's called a perception. And perceptions have everything to do with the choices you make, the things you create, the relationships you have, and the behaviors that you demonstrate. So then if you want to study someone's beliefs and perceptions, study their behaviors, especially when they're alone. So attitudes create beliefs, beliefs create perceptions. How many people are still with me? <clears throat> so we live in two states of mind. Living in survival is living in stress. And of course, then living in stress, there is contraction in the body. There is contraction in tissues. There's contraction. <clears throat> we move into dis-ease or imbalance. There's always breakdown in the body when that occurs. There'll be degeneration if it goes on for an extended period of time. Fear, anger, sadness, primary emotions in survival. You're living in a very selfish state. And when you're being chased by T-Rex, you're thinking about only three things. Your attention is on your body. Your attention is on your environment, where you're gonna run, and your attention is on time. How much time do I have to get there? The body, the environment, and time. And then, of course, we become enslaved 
to the rules of the body, the environment, and time. There's always energy lost. The person is living in emergency mode. They narrow their focus on something, an object, a thing, and they can't stop thinking about it. In fact, when a person is addicted to the hormones of stress, 10 great things could happen in their day. And one bad thing will happen and they will obsess about that one bad thing because in survival, <laughs> you gotta be ready for the worst thing to happen because if it happens again, you gotta know how to deal with it. So most people are always preparing for the worst when they live in survival. Of course, when you're experiencing uh, stress and survival, you experience separation. <laughs> you feel your senses are heightened, you become a materialist, and you experience separation from you and everybody else. And if they look differently than you, that's even more separation. And by the same means, there's you here, and then there's your dreams, and you place your dreams way over there. And most people are separate from their dreams, and they have to run and rush to get them. And that is how human beings live. Reality is determined by the senses. Most people are living by cause and effect. They only see limited possibilities because they're predicting their future based on their past. There is incoherence in the brain. We've measured this thousands of times. There's incoherence in the heart because you're stepping on the gas pedal and you're stepping on the brake at the same exact time because you're not running, you're not fighting, you're not hiding. You're sitting there in those chemicals and not knowing what to do with them. So then, most people cling to the familiar and cling to the known because the unknown in survival is a very scary place. So most people then spend their whole lives wishing, wanting, trying, hoping, praying, and nothing ever changes. Now, living in a state of creation, there will always be homeostasis. There will be expansion. We've actually measured the electromagnetic field around people's bodies. When they start feeling gratitude, there's an expansion of energy. There's a release of energy. The body goes into anabolism, or what's called tissue repair. There's health, there's regeneration. The elevated emotions of love, joy, trust, knowing, gratitude, those are selfless emotions. This is where people serve the best. This is where they truly serve the best, the ones that are heart-centered. And it turns out you can teach that. And we have research to show that whether you're young, whether you're old, whether you're sick, whether you're healthy, whether you're a vegetarian, whether you're not, whether you're successful, whether you're poor, it doesn't matter. You can teach a person how to create this type of coherence. <clears throat> now, when a person's in a state of creation, they have no attention on their body. They have no attention on their environment. They don't even be thinking about time. They're, they're transcendent of their identity. That is the moment now, that transcendental moment where they're in the creative state. And living in creation is when you forget about yourself. That is the moment you're truly creating. <clears throat> of course, there's growth and repair in the body. We tend to go from a narrow focus to an open focus. Open focus means you're no longer focusing your attention on an object. You're aware, your awareness opens, and we now know that if you teach a person how to open their awareness and you measure their brain, we've done this thousands and thousands of times, the brain gets highly integrated, highly organized, more, more, more whole. And when the brain is working right, you're working right. And when your brain isn't working right, you're not working right. And when you're living in stress and you're trying to predict and control everything in your life and you're shifting your attention from one person to one problem to one thing to one place to another person to another problem, every one of those elements has a neurological network in your brain. And the arousal of those stress hormones combined with switching attention creates a very incoherent brain. And that person's narrowing their attention on knowns. And if you teach them how to do the exact opposite, it's the formula where the brain starts to synchronize. And what sinks in the brain, links in the brain. And all of a sudden, the person starts feeling more like themselves. Of course, they feel more connected. They're interested in a reality beyond their senses because they're in the creative state. Now they're no longer living by cause and effect. They feel like they're causing an effect. They start seeing new possibilities. The brain and heart become highly coherent. And then they're craving the unknown. They're not shrinking from it. They want the adventure. And this is when the magic starts to happen. So check this out. <clears throat> People all of a sudden make a different choice. 
they head in the wrong direction, they're no longer on purpose, it started with a thought. That thought led to a choice, that choice led to a behavior, that behavior created an experience, and that experience produced an emotion. And now the person has lost their sense of purpose and forgot about their goals, and they return back to the old self just for the familiar feeling of the old self. Of course, you can do the same thing when it comes to staying healthy. We've all done this. You make a different choice because you had a different thought, a familiar thought that led to the same behavior, the same experience, and the same feeling. So now, you have three brains that allow you to go from thinking to doing to being. The yellow brain right there is called your neocortex. It's the most evolved in human beings and dolphins. It's the seat of your identity and your personality. It's the seat of your conscious awareness. Underneath that brain, right in the middle, is called the limbic brain, or the chemical brain, or the emotional brain. And that red brain, then, is the subconscious brain. Now, your brain is made up of 100 billion neurons. The number of connections on the average neuron is about 40,000 to 10,000 connections. If you took a scoop of gray matter the size of a grain of sand, you would have 100,000 neurons in it with over a billion connections. <clears throat> Those neurons aren't two-dimensional, they're actually three-dimensional. They communicate in an X, Y, Z axis in all directions. So then, learning is making new synaptic connections. If you learned anything today, this is what happened in your brain. Well, he's kind of talking fast. I think I'll pay attention. Oh, now I understand. That's learning. Every time you learn something new, this happens in your brain. It's happening right now. One whole neurological network connecting with another neurological network. We call this the aha phenomenon. In the brain, the sum of the parts is greater than the whole. This is understanding right there. Now, there's a principle in neuroscience that says that nerve cells that fire together wire together. The more you think the same thoughts, the more you demonstrate the same behaviors, the more you create the same feelings and emotions, the more you assemble new circuitry to reflect it. And so then if you keep firing, you keep wiring, all of a sudden you form what's called a memory. And memory is the maintaining or sustaining of those connections. And now, just like any relationship, the more you communicate, the more you connect. And neurons are very, very social. How many people are with me? Does this make sense? So then, if you get enough neurons beginning to connect with one another, you form what's called a neurological network or a neural net. And a neural net is just gangs of neurons that have just fired and wired together to form a community of neurosynaptic connections that's related, related to a thought, a skill, behavior, a habit, an action. It's something that you've done so many times that you no longer have to consciously think about it. But these neurological networks are not just chemical, they're in fact very electrical. You want to see a thought? Watch this. Boom, there's a thought. You generate more electrical impulses in your brain in one day than all the cell phones on the planet put together. And it's not coming from the breakfast you ate. You're connected to a resource of energy. So neurological networks, you have a neurological network to brush your teeth, you have a neurological network to walk, to speak a language, to complain. It's something you've done so many times that you don't even have to consciously think about it. Are you with me still? So then, knowledge is the precursor to experience. The more knowledge you have, the more prepared you are for an event. If people can get their behaviors to match their intentions, or their mind and body working together, their actions equal to their thoughts, the end product of an experience is called the emotion. Now they're embodying the truth. Knowledge is for the mind, experience is for the body. Now they're embodying that chemically. So then, this is how I raised my kids. Once you understand how you created the experience, that's called wisdom. And wisdom then is evolution, and you can then add it to your knowledge base, and that's called life. If people keep living by the same emotions every single day, and they're derived from the hormones of stress, they keep signaling the same genes. And genes make proteins, and proteins are responsible for the structure and function of your body. And the expression of proteins is the expression of life. 
And I don't care if you have the most vegetarian, organic, food combining diet. If you're living in fear your entire life, it is the fear that's down regulating the gene. Change that, and all of a sudden, the body takes that information from the environment of the cell and begins to make new proteins. So when you have an experience, experience enriches the circuits in your brain. Once those circuits are enriched, the end product of an experience then is when that limbic brain begins to make a chemical or an emotion. Now the chemistry is reaching the body, not just the mind. It's no longer philosophical. It's becoming very real. And there's what's called a neuropeptide that begins to signal hormonal centers, and you feel uplifted. You feel invincible. You feel free. You feel abundant, whatever it is. So then, here's the moment of truth. You come to the seminar this week, you gain all this knowledge and information. You're walking around your office telling a person, hey, you need to be more emotionally intelligent. You know, you need to forgive. You know, you need to you know, work on this. Telling everybody everything to do. And you're invited to the party, and there's the person at the party that betrayed you, the person that you don't like, you know, the enemy that you have. And now you walk into the woman's bathroom and you start thinking, if you're a woman anyway, you start thinking about how you're going to murder your enemy, how you're going to poison her wine. What are you going to do to get back at her because she betrayed you? Now, remember, stress is when your brain and body are knocked out of balance, but now it's not a lion, it's your coworker. So here you go, you start auto-suggesting to yourself. I hate my coworker. These are thoughts that are producing emotions. She betrayed me last year, I'm gonna get her back. And now, you're turning on the primitive nervous system and you're moving into emergency and you will go unconscious and not remember anything you learned in your brain. You'll go unconscious and return back to the old self. Are you with me still? But we have this ability because of the size of the frontal lobe. Your frontal lobe is your, your creative center. It makes up 40% of your entire brain. This is what separates us from all other species. 40% in humans, 14 to 17% in monkeys and gibbons, 7% in dogs, 3% in cats. And if your cat is smarter than you, I'll give you an idea how much of your frontal lobe you're using. It's the seat of our free will. It's where we learn. It's where we have intention. It's where we invent. It's where we have attention. It's when we speculate new possibilities. We decide. We have behavior control. We can focus our concentration, and we can restrain our emotional reactions. This is the seat of your conscience. So here you are, the old self. You get the word that she's at the party. And we have this ability to observe our thoughts. So then if you're observing your thoughts, it means you're no longer the program. You are the consciousness observing the program, and you have to become conscious in order to change. So then you can look at those thoughts and observe them without engaging them. In neuroscience, it's called metacognition. If you observe the thought without participating in it, the observation of the thought separates you from the thought. Now you're beginning to objectify from your subjective self. And observing those or being present with them without reacting to them is the art of change. So now, here you are. You're observing those thoughts and you're settling those thoughts down, no longer firing and wiring those thoughts. And then you say, wait a second. I read the book on compassion by the Dalai Lama. I read the book by Mother Teresa on forgiveness. I went to the emotional intelligence seminar and the emotional releasing seminar. I got some circuits in my brain that I can use. So you gather yourself up in the bathroom and you say, okay, what is it to forgive? What is it to have compassion? How am I going to take this knowledge and do something with it? This is the moment of truth. So when you begin to say, what am I going to do differently? You turn on which part of your brain? The frontal lobe. That's the workshop. That's the boss, that's the CEO, that's the symphony leader. And all of a sudden now, you ask the question, what is compassion? And now you gotta search for those circuits in your brain. Yeah, I gotta see myself in her. I don't really like that, but I guess I'll do it. Gotta let go of the past. And all of a sudden, you start remembering what, you're, what you've learned. When you get enough of these circuits firing in tandem, the next thing you know, you're in a scene. Your brain begins to imagine you in the future. And now when you do that, you're beginning to install the neurological hardware in your brain in preparation for walking out of that bathroom. You're priming your brain to do something differently. 
Are you with me still? And all of a sudden, you get a vision in your mind or a picture in your mind, and that's called intention. And if you can get your behaviors to match your intentions and walk out of that bathroom and do exactly what the book said or what the lecture said, the moment you do that properly and you follow the instructions, you start to feel compassion in your heart. You start to feel forgiveness. You start to feel an elevated emotion. And now your body is understanding what your mind understood and you're embodying the truth of it. Now, you can't do it once and be expected to be on the stained glass windows in church. You got to be able to reproduce the experience. And Aristotle said, we are what we repeatedly do. So then, if you then begin to restrain certain thoughts and you're no longer firing and wiring them, nerve cells that no longer fire together no longer wire together. The universal law is you don't use it, you lose it. We call this the science of changing your mind or throwing out the mental trash. Here we go. Here's the new thought called, I want to be compassionate. I want to experience forgiveness. You want to fire that thought. There's only one problem. Look at all these other thoughts going on in the brain at the same time. I want to murder her. I want to get back at her. You know, all those thoughts. Those are circuits from the past. But we have this ability as human beings that has to do with our attention and our will. If you keep firing and wiring that thought and you keep your attention on it, where you place your attention is where you place your energy. And all of a sudden, if you keep going in spite of those other voices in your head, and you focus your attention with your frontal lobe, sooner or later, that is going to be the strongest signal to the brain. And the moment it becomes the strongest signal, watch what happens. The strongest signal now begins to cause this neuron to want to glue to the remaining neurons. So now the blue one has got is the strongest signal and the brain has to begin to make a connection and glue it. Now, the thought travels in that direction from from the top to the bottom, but you see the purple there? That's the glue. But there's only a certain amount of glue to go around in the brain. So if we're going to glue this circuit, it starts stealing the glue from the neighboring circuits. And all of a sudden then, as you start to glue this circuit, you begin to prune the circuits of your past. There goes the thought of murdering her. There goes the thought of your past. There goes the thought of getting back at her. There goes your anger. And the only thought now that's traveling is called compassion. And in neuroscience, this is called pruning. And this is the process of change. So then this is what it looks like in real time. Unhooking from the old self, reconnecting to the new self. And it happens in a matter of seconds. So if you keep doing it over and over again, Aristotle said, we are what we repeatedly do. Excellence there is not an action, but a habit. So we start out unconsciously skilled, then we become consciously unskilled. You know, when you learn that you don't know, I tell my kids, you need at least one of these a day. Now you know that you don't know. If you begin to expose yourself to information, you begin to train, you begin to apply, you can reach a certain point where you'll become consciously skilled. This is where most people stop. But when a person begins to master something, they've done it so many times now, they're unconsciously skilled. They no longer have to consciously think about it. It is a way of life. It is who they are. It is innate in them. So then, the process of change is unlearning and relearning. It's breaking the habit of the old self and reinventing a new self. It's pruning synaptic connections and sprouting new connections. It's unmemorizing emotions that are stored in the body and reconditioning the body to a new mind and to a new emotion, to unfire and to unwire, to refire and to rewire. It's literally to lose your mind and create another one. It's becoming familiar with the old self, so familiar and so conscious of the old self, you won't go unconscious to it again, and becoming familiar with the new self. And the word meditation, the translation of that word means to become familiar with. That's what it means. And when you begin to become familiar with a new self, you're doing it so many times, thinking so many ways, new ways, acting in so many different ways, feeling different emotions, it begins to become familiar to you. It's deprogramming and reprogramming. It's moving from living in your past to creating a new future. It's going from an old energy to a new energy. And I've been doing this since 1999, and I can tell you, nobody changes until they change their energy. And when you change your energy, you change your life. So here's the last question. <clears throat> Every great person in history understood this. <clears throat> 
Can you believe in a future that you can't see or experience with your senses yet, but you've thought about enough times in your mind that your brain is literally changed to look like the event has already occurred? Latest research in neuroscience says it's absolutely possible. And can you begin to emotionally embrace a new future reality before it's made manifest? and begin to experience that emotion to such a degree that your body as the unconscious mind is beginning to believe it's living in that future reality in the present moment. And you're beginning to change your genes to look like your body has already experienced it. The latest research in epigenetics says it's absolutely possible. Now think about this. If your brain and body are physically changed ahead of the actual experience, you just move from living in your past present reality to living in your future present reality. In fact, you're living ahead of time. When you successfully apply this new paradigm, your brain and body are no longer a record of the past, but now a map to the future. And to live by this law is to live by the quantum law of reality, which says when you change your mind, 